Awesome. Well, thank you for, for being here and I appreciate your time. Um, this you. podcast is about your journey in music um, and, and how you got to where you are now. I, and we'll talk about your new podcast th uh, that's coming out and your book and, and everything else in between, if that's cool with you. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Jeff, tell me where, whereabouts did you grow up? I grew up in San Fernando Valley and uh, in, a, in a time where the valley, um, you're in San Diego, right? Yeah, we're in San Diego. Yeah. So there were still like, I don't want to date myself, but there were still like where I grew up, like dirt roads. And it was like mm -hmm. kind of, you know, it was pretty insane. <laughs> Not like the Wild West or Pioneers. There weren't people gold mining, but it was. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, you know, we all had like BMX little bikes and stuff. Um, but I grew up in the 70s. Okay. And uh, there was just an incredible amount of amazing music by all these just so diverse artists and whatnot. And I lived in an area where uh, I was like lower middle class. And so I was privy to be exposed to a ton of great influential artists of lots of different genres. So mm -hmm. it was pretty dope. And, and I got bust into a, into a junior high and, and during even elementary school, I was like super, super into music, you know? Mm -hmm. But uh, I was just thinking back, I, I got bust into a, a junior high uh, you know, to integrate everybody. And so that was an extremely pivotal time for me where I was, uh, you know, I was going on the bus with certain kids and listening to ACDC, Van Halen, you know, um, and then going into classes where I remember sitting with these two girls. And I, I just didn't even think about it until like this morning that had an impact on my life. And it was this art class. And I was one of the only white kids in this group. And these two girls were like, oh, my God, this guy, Michael Jackson, blah, 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 blah. And then they played Grandmaster Flash. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, it, like, changed my perspective. I was like, you know, hearing all this, you know, hard, hard rock. rock and, yeah. you know, and then I got super into everything else. So it was, uh, I grew up in it. I think growing up in a diverse culture really helped a lot, you know? Totally. Yeah. To that's, so you were bust in to they would have kids from all over the San Fernando Valley and they would bust them into one area. Well, kind of. city and I was bust into kind of a worse area. Sure. Okay. Some of, some of my friends got, you know, carpools, but my family didn't, uh, you know, they didn't, my, both my parents worked, so I, I had to take the bus. Yeah. yeah. Gnarly, gnarly experience for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, well, you were, you got into music early listening. Like did, I know you do songwriting sessions and stuff too, where you, do you, when did you start playing music? Um, well, in my neighborhood, all the kids were like into Kiss. Okay. <laughs> they used to do these, um, like, you know, little shows and charge everybody like a couple bucks to go and see everybody dress up. And <laughs> I remember telling my mom, you know, I want to play drums. And she's like, yeah, that's not going to happen. And, uh, so I would take, you know, they used to have these coffee, coffee cups. Like, I think it was like a chock full of nuts. And I'm really dating myself, but it was just like a chock full of nuts. And I had several of them and I had pencils. Oh, it was just like, you know, <laughs> playing, you know, just I had Zeppelin and Queen. Now, you know, I think I had Boston, ELO, and I would just sit in my room, and, you know, just ding, 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 you know, on these coffee cans. And, you know, uh, that was my first instrument was chock full of nuts. <laughs> I was about that. Did you end up getting a drum kit later? Did you at once? Your yeah. Parents, so you were serious with the, with the nuts? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, my mom was so adamant that I not play the drums. Uh, she told me, well, she, she allowed me to push and push and she allowed me to take a class that she thought would break me of my desire. So I went to this drum class, uh, this drum uh, little school and the guy goes, just told the musician, you know, teacher told my mom, he goes, your son's really talented. You need to get him a drum set. And she's like, okay, we're leaving. And she, that was the end of the lesson. She thought she end thought of the lesson. <laughs> Oh, she, she totally thought I would give up. And oh. so I, I didn't, but I, I got no drum set. And so I went back to Chock Full of Nuts. And then I was going into, God, I was, I was probably 12, 13, 14, something like that. And my mom, uh, one of my buddies had like, you know, this big, I don't know if you remember, Peter Chris from Kiss. He had like yeah. 50 drum sets. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so my buddy had one of these two kick drums, you know, and 
he's like, I got to get rid of half my drums. I have too many drums. And I'm like, why? And he goes, you want to buy some? I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> and my mom comes over, she watched me play. And she's like, there's no way you're going to get a drum set. And I begged and I screamed. And she goes, you will get a drum set if you get straight A's for an entire year. Wow. And at that time, I was like a straight BC student. I'm like, there's no way that's going to happen. I go, I'm going to shoot all B's. And she goes, no, straight A's for you. And so the, another thing where she was absolutely positive that I would never, you know, achieve this goal and get a drum set. And sure enough, man, I just changed all my study habits. And it was Mr. Hickman geometry class. And if you're still alive, Mr. Hickman, you, you, you stressed the hell out of me. <laughs> and I had, I think I had a, B going in and there was no way in hell I was going to get an A because it was, you know, the final, whatever it was. And there wasn't enough points or whatever to, to make you know, it an whatever, A. Whatever, whatever the hell happened. Yeah. I tell my mom, I'm riding my bike up this monster hill and I tell my mom, I got straight A's. She goes, you got straight A's? She goes, what about geometry? I'm like, straight A's except geometry. And she's like, you should be very proud of yourself. And I'm like, I am. I go, can we get my drum set? She goes, no, this, you didn't. You didn't <laughs> So I went in this severe depression and then about uh, three weeks later, the mail came and sure enough, straight A's. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So did you, mom, did you tell the drum story to the, to the geometry teacher? Uh, you know, I may have, this was many, many, many yeah, ago. I don't know if he gave you a little boost on your grade <laughs> to get that kid. No, no, my, my, my chemistry teacher did though. He, I, I had a good way of enabling that. That's how I ended up in law school, but <laughs> um, I never forget. So my mom, being, you know, the, the woman that she is, she goes, okay, fine, we'll go get your drums. And we go get the drums. And I go, well, what about the cymbals? And she goes, no, our deal was for the drums. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, mom, I can't play without the, you know, a pedal stand. She goes, no, we agreed to drums. I was like, there's no way to play it. So I had to like beg and, you know, long, long story short, um, I ended up getting all my stuff and, you know, buying stuff off of friends. And I finally at one point had a, a drum set and now another real interesting little sidestep story, you may want to edit this out, but I was so fanatical about it during the summer. So this is uh, San Fernando Valley. It was insane heat. It was like 110, 15 degrees. Uh -huh. And my mom made me play in the garage, which she had insulated for like another room. So <laughs> it had to be like 140 degrees sweat, you know, like oh, you go in there yeah. and it's a sauna box. <laughs> and I used to, you know, come home, you know, uh, from, from camp and, and my mom, you know, immediately would call up and she goes, hey, the next door neighbor is calling the cops. I'm like, I hate this neighbor, right? <laughs> and I'm like, mom, I go, I go how could she, she hates my drumming. She's like, she's calling the cops, you better stop now. So literally for years, probably about 30 years later, I, you know, I see this neighbor and after I had made it in uh, the music business, I come over to her, I, you know, it's over the, the fence, I'm at my mom's house and I go, you know what? you tried to screw up my entire youth and my life. And then she's like, what's wrong, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you called the cops on a little kid every day. And she's like, what are you talking about? She goes, I used to love your drumming. And I'm like, call and tell my mom you were calling the cops, you hated it. And she's like, your mom was lying to you. So I, I, I called my mom and my mom's like, oh God, I just didn't want you playing drums when I came home. <laughs> I this woman's house and was like, ugh. I, I, I harbored such hate for this one. So, um, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. Cool, yeah. uh, well, then you've, you've got the kid, obviously. And then was it was it bands from there? Or uh, Well, yeah. I, um, I played in a couple bands. Uh, God, in junior high and a little bit in high school. And then I had a drum set when I was in college. And then in law school, my buddy and I um, literally... We hated law school so much. He was at USC, I was at Loyola. And we both got guitars and I got a keyboard. So we taught each other, you know, guitar. I taught myself a little bit of keyboard, but I couldn't have my drums there. But then we started a full rock band and we were oh. playing that Monge and all these little, you know, places. And uh, yeah, we, we had like a, a full on rock band, which led to me discovering what a and R was um, when I was in law school, which is a whole other thing. Well, yeah. So, cause that, that's fascinating. What fascinates me is that, yeah, the A&R and how you get into that world. And is that through, did you have to do that through 
getting your law degree? Is that kind of how it works? Like because of contracts? Like talk to me about that. Oh, I'm um, so fascinated. Law school was probably um, a detriment. Well, it was a detriment to getting into the music business. Really? Um, yeah. So I found out what A&R was um, completely by accident. So I was, I was at UCLA uh -huh. um, and I was, I was working at, so I was like one of those type of people that was like, whatever it is, I'm going to try to do now because I know my life's going to be over by the time I get out of, you know, school cool. and I'm going to be in some job that I hate. <laughs> right. uh, I took this acting class, you know, like the ones you see on the, you know, those bad TV shows, like somebody goes into an acting class and, you know, they get discovered, but they never do it. Some hack. Right. Well, that's what it was. It was a bunch of hacks. <laughs> but this one, this agent guy shows up and it's like, oh, you know, you're, you do this 10 week little commercial uh, class. And this guy comes at the end and he goes, he goes, you, you have a good look. And I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah, he goes, I could have used you for X, Y, and Z. He goes, I'm going to send you out on a commercial the next, you know, next day. And sure enough, I went out and I got a Pepsi commercial and I got Wrigley Spearman and I got this wow. national commercials. So I was, um, I was working for Harvey Levin at TMZ. Uh, wow. but this was when it was C, C, he was a legal reporter for, uh, KCBS TV, which was the news station. Uh -huh. are playing, he's like, he's like, man, you, you need to go to law school and, you know, be a, a non-screen reporter, you know, legal reporter, because you should go to law school. So long story short, I was acting, doing X, Y, and Z. I went to law school because of Harvey Levin. Damn him. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I hated it the minute I got there. Like, literally, I, I had a, a panic attack the minute before. I'm like, what the hell am I doing? I, I, I want to go to law school. Mm -hmm. And, this guy doesn't give a crap about me, you know, he's, you know, he's, he's just a reporter. So right. I'm in law school and yeah, me and my buddy started uh, this band and my fraternity brother during college goes, hey, my, my brother is dying to meet you. I'm like, he's dying to meet me. He's, I'm like, cool. He's like, yeah, he, he works at Geffen Records. And so I was like, all right, cool. You know, and so I go in and, uh, you know, I'm wearing this like tie and, you know, I, I had the long hair pulled back in a ponytail which <laughs> yeah. was cool back then and now very embarrassing. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I had the earring, I think with the angel, <laughs> the dangle, <laughs> yeah, but I had a pull, you know, the Oxford polo. So yeah, I looked, I looked like a mess of styles <laughs> and, uh, I'll never forget. I go, I go in and, you know, it was just, it was surreal. There's Axl Rose coming out and I'm like, Oh shit! And mind you, I'm I'm in, I'm in my second year of law school. And I open these doors. He comes out. I'm like, oh shit! And I'm like, I'm 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 sitting there, and this guy comes up, and you know, total like you know the kind of just rocker kind of vibe, ripped t you know ripped jeans, all this. I'm like, damn. So I go into his office. He goes, my name's Craig. I go into his office. He goes on. He's like, man. He goes. Your band's amazing, you know, you're incredible. I love that you write, blah, 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 all this stuff. He's like, I want to sign you to a deal, of course. And I'm just like, this is amazing. I'm just sitting there like, my head's blown. You know, mind you, he didn't know we had only played, I think, three gigs. Oh, wow. So I'm like, bye-bye, <laughs> law school. Right. You know? <laughs> uh, all, the, all those, you know, the, the kids in law school were just like, oh, you know, you have the long hair and the goatee, you, you know, you're gonna fail right uh, which i almost did but uh you know he's telling me all this stuff and he's like man he goes i love you know that show you did at the, at the whiskey and i'm just like thinking like you know the whiskey i'm like yeah can you get us a gig there and he, he, long story short the guy's like looking at me he's like oh god you're the wrong guy he's like i'm gonna kill, uh -oh. kill my brother. <laughs> Thanks, sir. and i'm just like oh, spencer so like this guy totally thinks I'm, I'm somebody else. And he goes like, man, he goes, you got to go. I guess I thought you were the drummer of this other band. And so I'm sitting there and I was just frozen. Cause I'm like thinking, you know, my, he's talking about, you know, Oh, touring and going to recording and right. like, my life's changed. I'm like, kiss law school goodbye. So, you know, all my dreams are like nuclear. Right. And I'm sitting there and I, I can't move. And the guys, the guys like, are you going to leave? And I'm like, uh, you know, what do you do? I'm just sitting there trying to talk and he tells me what A&R is. Uh -huh. And he go, and I go, well, what do you do A&R? And he goes, A&R, he goes, I go out and see bands and, you know, I decide on which bands are going to make it or not. And I'm like, how is that a job? I mean, how is that <laughs> actually 
fit into the universe where, you know, I go, but how do you get paid? And he goes, I get paid to do that. And I'm like, who's going to pay you to do that? <laughs> think about it. I was going out and I, I was actually so aggro about music. I was, you know, remember those, uh, when you grew up in Southern California, the, the guys, the yellow jackets that were security guards. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I was, I, I got one of those jobs too, but I took oh, the, okay. I was the sneak who actually stole the yellow jacket. <laughs> to use it to get in shows. Oh yeah, I was like, oh, I go, oh you, you go work over there. I'm like, okay, got it, boss. <laughs> I still, I think I still have one of those yellow jackets hidden away as memorabilia. That's um, amazing. But so, uh, yeah, long story short, uh, he goes, yeah, I, I get to go see bands and all this. I'm like, I want that job. Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, he goes, you can't just get this job. And I go, well, how do you get it? He goes, you know what? Just come to this UCLA class uh, that he was guest lecturing at. And you can learn about it. And I went to that class and I was literally, my mind was blown once again. And I was like, this is what I want to do with my life. So seeing in the back row, sneaking into that class, not paying my little fee. I think Randy Jackson was on the, on the uh, panel. Wow. Uh, and I was like, this is what I want to do with my life. So I set out to make that my ultimate goal. That's amazing. And from, yeah. from there, you, well, you finished law school, you said. Mm -hmm. And then you just decided, like at that point, did you not try to like get a job as a lawyer or you were just oh, yeah, over it? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, having long hair and earring and, and uh, on your resume drummer uh, doesn't go well with most law firms. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it really doesn't. It's like people look at me like, so didn't you intern for a judge? I'm like, oh no, but I did sell shoes at Bloomingdale's. And, <laughs> and I was like literally that guy I remember because I was in the rock band and I would give out my flyers to the girls uh, and then, you know, coming in for the, the shoes. Mm -hmm. and this is the perfect way for, you know, not really thinking that, yeah, I should be in, well, I, I, I knew I should have been interning for a judge or a, a, a law firm, but it didn't seem as much fun. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, then how did you end up getting your foot in the door and, you know, discovering huge bands like you have? So during that time, during law school, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I went to uh, the, whatever the placement for internships and I go, I want to, I want to intern mm -hmm. for a record company. And <laughs> there was, uh, you heard of Rhino Records? Yeah, I have. Amazing company. Well, I got, I got a, a job interning for them. Wow. And this guy, John, I don't want to call him out. Anyways, this, the guy who was my boss for some reason hated me. And uh, <laughs> I kept giving him my, you know, my band, uh, you know, that we were in. And he's like, no, you should be just inputting this stuff in the computer. Long story short, uh, my roommate got a internship there after I did. And mm -hmm. to demonstrate how bad my internship was, uh, during their Christmas thing, you know, they, they would never took me out to lunch. They would always take all the interns, the other interns out for lunch. This guy just had a weird competition with me. <laughs> yeah, that's bizarre. And my roommate leaves in, in this, this Christmas dinner and I'm like, let's talk about the worst interns we ever had. And so he's like, who was that guy that wanted to be in that rock band that always, you know, <laughs> went to a and r Who was that guy? That guy was horrible. And my, my, you know, my roommate is sitting there, you know, eating lunch. He's like, who was that guy? He's like, Jeff, Jeff Blue. And he's like, Pff, you know, spits at his food. He's like, I'm still living with the guy. So at least, just like, oh my God, cracking up. Um, so that was my first internship. And then I worked for uh, MCA Records. Uh, okay. Got this wonderful woman, Mindy Espy, who literally just hit me up. Um, she allowed me, so I interned in the copyright department, which is the legal department. And I came to her and I go, look, I, I want experience. I'll work for free, whatever it is, um, working for you guys in a and admin. And I used to go around to every single a and person. And I mean, it was Al Teller there. There was just all these like legendary people. Mm -hmm. And I go, have me listen to tapes, whatever, whatever you need. And uh, one of the things that really set me off, there was this, uh, uh, they were having me like, you know, type up on an electronic typewriter, the actual work, you know, the song title names. Okay. And I got that one day, dude, like this guy comes in, it was, it was that one of the head guys at the label and he's like, who typed up this cassette card? And I'm sitting there like, it was me, you know? <laughs> yeah. like, this is off center, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, he's like throws the cassettes down. And I'm like, oh, so that was my, you know, that, I wasn't even working for the guy. I was doing it for yeah. free. <laughs> 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 Furious. 
And so I'm almost in tears, like, you know, I get, I'm like, it looks perfect to me, you know, but you had to literally type out every song title, the number, you know, seconds and all this stuff. Oh my and, gosh. Um, so I go into this guy afterwards, Denny Deontay, and I, I'm telling him, I go, man, I really want to do A&R. He goes, you know what, Jeff? He goes, I love your drive. He goes, here's a box of cassettes. Take them home and tell me what you like and, you know, analyze it. Tell me which ones are best. So I go through, I take it home. I blew off all my law, you know, homework over the weekend. And I go and I write documents. You know, I'm, I'm this lawyer kid. So I'm just like outlines, did it, did it, songwriting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, musicianship, unique, you know, uniqueness, you know, uh, and I come in, I have this like stack of pages all typed perfectly because God forbid I type anything out of the out of sure. You had a ruler out making sure it's straight. <laughs> and I go into this guy and I'm like, here you go. I lay it down. He goes, and I give him like a booklet. He goes, what is this? I go, this is, you know, the analysis of all these songs. He goes, you're kidding. And then he goes, I don't want to read this. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You want? He goes, I just want to know which ones you thought were good. Tell me which ones. And I go, are you kidding me? He goes, you analyzed every word. He goes, you analyzed lyrics and verses and choruses, pre-choruses. <laughs> He's like, geez. He goes, he goes, you're going to scare the hell out of anybody you work for. <laughs> and so, and he's like, I can't have you do this. He goes, you're, you're freaking me out. But this guy's like, Denny Deontay. And he, he goes, you just need to find your own niche, Jeff. And so I'm looking around his office and I saw, you know, the same thing everywhere in every office was, you know, the plaques, but everybody had these music magazines mm -hmm. and they'd read them and, and they would look at these things and go, Hey, these are, this is what's happening. This is what's buzzing. And so long story short, I go, the only way I'm going to get into anybody's face that's going to actually read what I'm doing is I got to be, become a journalist. So there was a whole nother job skill that I didn't have that I had to BS my way into. So that's, <laughs> that's how I eventually got into that. It's a long winded story, but that's, thank you. Thanks to cold brew. There you go. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. I was always so curious at that job. Cause I thought I was like, that'd be the coolest job ever. You just get to shoot, go to shows and find bands and, if you think they're cool or, or whatever. Um, but like talk, so how was Lincoln Park like the first band that you ended up signing? Who was the first band you signed? Um, so ironically, I became a journalist by BSing my way into getting a job as mm -hmm. a writer. Um, yeah, I, I confused the hell out of people. I, I told one woman, yeah, I, I'm a writer already at your magazine, who's the new editor. I go out and I, the first band I went and saw, I didn't like, but a band went up after that named Fiction Alley. And the bass player and I, I was at the Troubadour and I actually brought a date. I had no money. So I was bringing dates like, you know, to shut like, so uh, <laughs> perfect, you know, perfect way. I'm like, oh, you know. Right. Hey, You're like, this is a free thing for me. <laughs> yeah. And I'm in, I'm in the, the restroom and this bass player comes up to me. I go, I go, hey, you guys were really good. And um, we start rapping. Long story short, I end up managing his band. I write an article for him um and I, I ended up becoming the drummer in the band so oh. the band started getting notoriety i started going out i mean i would i did all my research i was going out to all the music conferences um you know i, I parlayed all of that into i wrote for billboard i started a magazine called crossroads music connection bam uh it's called grip or um there was uh just a whole bunch of different rock magazines you know mm -hmm. hits magazine and uh Long story short, uh, I finally got a job at Zomba Music Publishing. I was sending out just catalogs of, you know, like probably a hundred articles at this point that I had written. And uh, yeah, I got a job. Uh, literally, Z was the last uh, letter in the alphabet, if you didn't know. And so uh, <laughs> I, I literally went down from A, you know, Atlantic Records, all the way up to this company called Z for Zomba, which I had never heard of. And uh, they were, uh, brave enough to give me a job after a lot of persuading. And, uh, you know, I, I went in there and they go, you have no experience. And I'm like, no, I, you know, I'm going to make somebody a lot of money. They basically told me that, you know, I wasn't qualified to do it. I didn't have experience. I left and I guess they couldn't find anybody to do the job as cheap as I would. So, <laughs> so but I called I, you back. I, I'm pretty sure I was the only one who would take the salary. So yeah, <laughs> I went in and I signed my band. <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> i've got the perfect band and i'm in it <laughs> yeah that's exactly what it was. <laughs> I yeah it was very bizarre so um my, the guy that I, I that hired me there was two guys david renser and then neil Courtney. i ended up uh running um you know the grammys uh 
and uh, Richard Blackstone. And they were like, here, you just need to you know, push these songwriters that we have. I'm like, well, what about signing artists mm-hmm. or co-publishing deals, you know, um, and we can develop them. They're like, mm, yeah, we don't do that. And I'm like, yeah, well, we should. It's more exciting. You know, like, you get to go out shit. I, I don't want to just be plugging songs. Right. And they're like, yeah, that's not really what we do. Like, and, and so I'm like, well, why don't you give me a budget? And you go, and then you know, after like, you know, a couple of weeks of just pushing, pushing, he goes, all right, we'll give you a hundred thousand bucks. And I was like, all right. And mind you, most publishing deals started around 250000 to $500,000 for public, you know, for bands at this point. Uh-huh. I'm like, all right, I can work with a hundred thousand dollars. You know, I probably sign my, my own band. <laughs> and I go, I can sign this one band for a hundred grand. He's like, no, 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 no. He goes, one band, he goes, 10 bands for a hundred thousand. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah, $10,000 a band. I go, you want me to sign bands for $10,000 for an entire co-publishing deal? He goes, absolutely. And he, again, just like my mom thought I would never be able to do it. Mm-hmm. So I sign my band. I immediately get them a deal. I drop out as the drummer mm-hmm. and, uh, got them a deal on A&M and then I went and signed another band called Fat, got them a deal. They were out of London and I got them a deal. Uh, and then I, you know, I'd done, I just started knocking them out of the park. I did, I signed a, a development deal with Macy Gray. That's uh, huge. Yeah. How, how, how are you finding these people just going to shows? Just scouring demos, man. I mean, oh, that, okay. everything. it was just my life, man. I absorbed music. So, um, Fat was brought in by my assistant, and that was a, a band based out of London. And that was actually um, like one of the first incarnations. Like it was a no offense to the lead singer, it was one of the guys in Madness. And then there's okay. E.D. Roundtree, who's now on. Who well, I'm doing a podcast with, ironically. Oh, um, cool! He was at Sirius doing Alt Nation forever, and now he does. Uh, he's you know a big personality on iHeartRadio uh-huh. for the rock uh, genre. So he was 17 years old and I found him in, in London. Wow. And brought him out uh, to LA, got him a record deal. And then, uh, yeah, did Macy, uh, Corn, Limp Biscuit, And I had this kid, uh, you know, I was also lecturing that, that class so much inspired me at UCLA that I took to find about a and mm-hmm. I decided I wanted to teach too. Mm-hmm. You know? And so I got a job teaching a class uh, called Artist Development in the Music Business and Songwriting. And I happened to be lecturing at the time also because I was a UCLA graduate in the communications department. Mm-hmm. And the, um, you know, I was looking for an intern to help me develop this woman, Macy Gray, who I just signed it. And everybody hated And uh, <laughs> he was the only kid in the class that, that really liked it. And, uh, you know, everybody was like, oh, yeah, I want an internship. He wants credit. So, um, yeah, the, Literally the next morning, I show up at, in my office and there's this kid in my seat, literally. Like, this kid was driven. It was like a, a mini me. And that's how, that's how I first got my taste of what would soon become Lincoln Park. And he was in a band that had never played a show. And uh, yeah, it was just, he just literally, the kid reminded exactly of me, like that, the chutzpah, the drive. Uh-huh. I'm up in your office, you know? <laughs> I'm in your <laughs> office, give me the job. Um, and so like he, he looked at my plaques on the wall and I remember he came to Limp Biscuit, and he goes, cause I'm gonna have a band way better than that. I'm like, geez, I go, man, yeah, he's, I love this kid. He's <laughs> yeah. <good person>. you <laughs> know and that's what it takes to be the star, right? Right. I'm like, yeah, I go, you're my intern. I mean, yeah, I have a stack of like, you know, other people who want, you know, uh, messages who wanted to intern. Like this kid's, this kid's a rock star. I just love him, you know, very confident and yeah. That's, and that's- that's how the, the relationship formed with, with Lincoln Park? Yeah, he goes, I'm, I'm starting a band. And I'm like, all right. And then he gave me the demo tape. And yeah, I was like, yeah, this is okay. And it was like three weeks into our, our internship. And uh, I, something I just knew, you know, like it, the, the tape wasn't even that good, but I was just like, damn it, this, there's something here. And I went to see their first show. And, wow. uh, you know, people were, people were, weren't really into it, but there was just something, you know, it was like that, the stuff that makes the, your arm hair stand up. You know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the guys came into my office afterwards and, um, you know, I'm like, I want to develop you guys, you know, let's, let's, let's do this. So that's basically the, the very, very long short of it, but it's just yeah. going on your gut instinct. Cause there's the, 
the rapper Mike Shinoda. Uh huh. He definitely had an urgency about him, and just something I couldn't put. You know, the songs weren't great. You know, it was just jointed. Mm -hmm. uh, but the there's some intrinsic quality that just grabbed me in there. I couldn't stop playing it. And I played it for all my friends. And I'm like, yeah, it sucks. You know. <laughs> Uh, but there was there was something there, man. And, um, you know, I stick with it. And I learned in my life, for the most part, when everybody else tells you you're wrong, that's a good indication that you can keep that moving. That you're right. <laughs> in your heart, you know? And because everybody told me the same thing with Macy Gray. They were like, dude, she's horrible. She's been passed on you know, by everybody. She was dropped by her manager. She was dropped by her publisher. She was dropped by her record label. Why would you touch that? Mm -hmm. I was like, I just love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, and I got she it. even re came back now. Did you like? There, there's a huge TikTok star like covering her song, right? Or it was mm -hmm. on TikTok, and it came. And I now hear it on Sirius Radio all the time. It's like her cover, a cover of it. Man, I and the the, the crazy thing is, so this is pre, really kind of pre internet because I I had to track Macy down. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is another interesting story about just conviction. Mm -hmm. um, her manager was shopping another band that had a it's huge record deal and she's like hey you know it's some people generally would want to take after you get a record deal you would do a publishing deal for the most part because you could get more money because there's already a guarantee that that record for the most part is going to come out so the risk as a mm -hmm. publisher is much less sure and your publishing value is, is much higher i don't know if you discuss this on on your your podcast but um so she comes to me she's like yeah everybody wants this you know we're gonna get five hundred thousand bucks and i'm listening to it. i'm like yeah Mm, I don't like it. <laughs> what do you mean you don't like it? You're the only publisher who doesn't like it. And I'm like, mm. yeah. And I was like, okay, well, what else you got? You know, I'm just like this young kid too, you know, like, and, and she's like, well, and she reaches into her, her bag and she's like, I have this artist, but she goes, you're not going to like it. And I'm like, oh, what is it? And she goes, that's oh, already been dropped by everybody. Nobody wants it. And, and uh, she gives it to me and I put it in and I hear this ridiculous voice mm -hmm. and it was Macy Gray. And then she goes, you hate it, right? And she goes, you just keep the tape. And I'm like, she goes, you hate it, right? I'm like, yeah, it's kind of bad. And I like, in myself, I'm thinking like, I can't let on how- That you want it. Yeah. <laughs> That's part of the business too. It's not like, you're like, wait, you're dropping this? I'm going to take it? She's going, oh, no, 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 give that tape back. Yeah, you know? give that back to me. <laughs> so, I mean, instantaneously going like, do not let on how much you freaking love this woman's voice. Mind you, I had no idea what she looked like. Uh -huh. And- just a, a little side note as to um, how important things are in your life that you, you go back and you trace back to the origins of where your interests lie. I was working um, several years prior as an attorney for the SBA, which is the Small Business Administration um, in, in Los Angeles. And there was this old guy, I was like, old, but he was old. He was like 25 years older than me, named Tano Tropia. And we would go on these, we had like these 45 minute lunches. It was like super government, you know, like we'd go out. And so we would go up into the hills in Chatsworth and eat our, you know, deli sandwich and rush back. And he, and he I remember one day he goes, I have this CD, I want, want to play you. And he goes, it's not your rock and roll stuff. Like, cause I was in a band and, uh, and I'm like, ah, oh, that's cool. You know, he's like, you're going to hate it. And he gives me the CD and we put it in. I blasted out of my, you know, I had a forerunner, blasted it out. And it was Nina Simone. Hmm. And I'm like, who is this? And he goes, and eh, it's like this jazz woman. But I'm like, dude, this is amazing. He's like, you actually like this? I'm <laughs> like, this is mind bending. And then he let me keep the CD and that changed my life. So when I heard Macy Gray was about three years later, mm -hmm. I was instantaneously brought back to me eating that deli sandwich with this guy, Tano, and listening to Nina Simone. I'm like, oh my God, I've got to have this. And so, had I probably not heard Nina Simone and like loved that, which turned me on to Billie Holiday and all that, then I would have never really maybe had formed that appreciation for Macy's voice that nobody else had because she was dropped. So long story short, again, um, that was a pivotal moment where I discovered where I had a variety of tastes. So I, you know, I was signing Corn, Limp Bizkit, all these hard rock bands, but the minute yeah. I heard Nina's voice, I was like, no, this is, this is an iconic voice. Mm -hmm. this is a must have and uh, I tracked her down which took three months to track this woman down oh my gosh and, and then I had to go through the process of convincing her to have a meeting because she goes I gave up on music I'm done really 
Yeah, so Macy Gray was done with music. She went back to Canton, Ohio, had a, another kid. I think she had three kids. And she and I remember when I called her, I mean, I tried and I tried and I guess I left messages. And finally she called back and I get this voice and I was like, wow, oh, is that Jeff? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I'm Miss Macy, you know? Finally. And, <laughs> and so I had no idea what she looked like until I actually met her in, uh, in New York. We met, we decided to meet in New York and, uh, you know, I did a very, very, very small deal with her and then shopped her and that whole thing too. We, I don't know if you, you knew the story, but I had to change her name because she had such a backlash against her, her music. So, um, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. Um, same thing we had to do with Lincoln Park and several other bands. Um, so she had, you know, she was dropped by everybody. Nobody liked Macy. And so we did this demo and people were just like, you know, this is amazing. Who is it? And I, I said, oh, this is Macy Gray. And people were like, oh, no, no way. We're not touching it. And a very, very huge, huge a &R person said the same thing. I was like, okay, I have a problem. Mm -hmm. And so we changed her name to Mushroom. Oh, um, I didn't know that. I remember because of her, her hairstyle. But Macy also, I guess we had, when we had our discussion, uh, she, was, she had told me that she had a band when she was like in college called Mushroom. Oh. Uh, we're, I'm changing this. And so we sent out the demo tape with much that changed the name to Mushroom. And I sent it out to all these, you know, the Clive Davis, uh, Paul Anthony, uh, Jimmy Iovine, and Jason Flom. Wow. And well, she top. <laughs> so her first record deal was with Tom Carroll in Atlantic. And I brought it up to Jason. He goes, We can't sign Macy Gray. You know, this is, man, she was dropped. There's no way. So I send this demo tape out to Jason Flom, who's in my opinion, probably the most preeminent, amazing a &R guy around and still in modern times. Um, and I get a call from Ahmet Erdogan and Jason Flom. And Ahmet Erdogan, who, I don't know if your listeners know, you know, he started Atlantic Records. He's, you know, if you ever saw the movie Ray, this is the guy who, you know, we, we yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, AC, whatever, Atlantic Records is one of the, the, the most amazing, you know, companies in the world um and they're on the phone they call me at home and they're like we love this mushroom this mushroom is amazing and i'm it's like i want to produce this mushroom for the 50th anniversary of atlantic records and i'm sitting there going like how the hell did these guys get my home number and it was like, <laughs> it was like a saturday and and i'm like well i go you you read you read the you know the letter i sent and he's like no i'm like I go, you didn't read it at all? He goes, yeah. He goes, I read it a little bit, but I'm like, did you read it at the bottom? I go, ha, 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 this is Macy Gray. <laughs> he goes, just like dead silent. And, and I'm like, hello, hello. You know, like, <laughs> did you hang up on me? <laughs> he's like, we're flying you out tomorrow morning. Uh, first class to, you know, meet with Ahmed and we, we want to sign. So that was how important uh, changing the name and rebranding and having a people's perception. And we had to do that same thing with uh, Lincoln Park because they were originally called Zero. And after we had this massacre of a show at the Whiskey, uh, the, where everybody in the, their grandma passed in the band, we decided to change the name of the band once we got uh, Chester in there too, changed it to Hybrid Theory. Oh, uh, okay. So they weren't, they, Chester wasn't with them in the very, very beginning? No. Oh, okay. You can ask me questions if you want. I could just go on and on. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Um, I do have a real. Uh, well, I did read that you you still consult. Are you still working for Atlantic? No, I, I can just consult for a variety of different people. Oh, a variety of different yeah, people. So, well, with that, like signing bands nowadays. I was I was talking with with Leah before you got on a little bit about this because it really it, you can see artists like everything in real time now you can see their popularity on instagram you can see how many streams they have on spotify you can see this that and the other thing is there is artist development still there and do you find bands that have like six thousand streams and are like like a lincoln park moment where like i know something is here and i know that they could do something but like well, obviously the numbers yeah. aren't there i think first of all there's a band grandson which we, we should talk about um, I love Grandson. We interviewed him already. Oh, okay. So they're in, I'm actually doing a docu series, and and the bands and my my best friend is the drummer in that band, and they okay. have a story, um, just like Lincoln. So Lincoln had zero press. Yeah, they only played one show when I signed them. Um, they had nothing. Uh -huh. you know? And I still believed in it, and that was a big uh, 
thing where people go, there's, there's no way these guys are, you know, nobody's coming out to see them. They have, you know, they have no fans, zero. You know, they had like maybe three or four buddies of theirs that would dance around at the show. Um, so uh, pre everything now, social media is so ridiculously important. Mm -hmm. It's annoying to me. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it takes away time. You, you know, you, it, it takes away the time from focus on the music because it's like having one person dedicated to social media and mm -hmm. pumping up your, your, you know, your, your likes and your, your views. And it's unfortunate. There is very little development that happens like in the, the old school days. Like, you know, you had, you know, Van Halen or like Ted Templeman guy, you know, Warner Brothers developing these bands. Mm -hmm. And that's what I got off on. You know, I loved finding that the bands that didn't have anybody, you know, right. Um, because I was able to get them cheaper, to be honest with you. I, I would be able to do these deals very, very inexpensively and spend the necessary time develop, de developing them rather than getting them after everybody's going, you guys are amazing, blah, 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 and the hype and blowing up, which is basically, you know, the press and, and radio was what, what social media affects with it is now. And then, so for example, like I brought in MGK in 2009 and really didn't have any following. Yeah, you know, no, that's funny. Cause I know I, I, I was working at Atlantic and they were like, you know, and this, you know, it wasn't a big deal. And a year later, his popularity rose, obviously, and you know, everybody was bidding on it. Um, the same thing with grandson is my best friend was the drummer in there. And they were on RCA as a, a different, um, you know, Jordan was in a different project. Mm -hmm. And I went to go see him at Hotel Cafe. And I was just blown away. And I took a buddy who was from a record label. And he goes, this band sucks. I'm like, are you <laughs> Kidding? I mean, there was like four people in the audience. I mean, this band is freaking amazing. And so I called up all my, my a &R folks, you know, everybody's like, eh, not into it. And a year later, yeah, I told my, so my best friend's name is David Remen. He ends up, he was in a band with Tyler Rich, uh, who got signed to Universal, a uh, country artist. And that was already blown up. They were opening up for Jason Aldean. Oh, cool wow. As an unsigned act. Jeez. And he was a drummer in that and Granson. And Granson had nothing going on. Really. Uh -huh. But Alice, Allison uh, Hagendorf at Spotify loved it. And sh so they had like zero followers um, and they didn't have like really any plays. And Allison got super behind it and started posting it and it reacted. Oh, okay. And I mean, the kid is just, in my opinion, a genius. He's, you know, he's like uh, Bob Dylan meets Rage Against the Machine with Trump. Oh, yeah. And I was so floored. I remember telling his manager and I'm like, yeah, you know, I, you know, I, would, I almost co-managed him, which I, I just, I should have pushed hard. I, I loved the band. I mean, I was just like, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, instantaneously, I was telling everybody about it. Then a year later, Allison posted up on Spotify, reacts. And I was at, I was videotaping the show for our docu-series where, you know, they had record labels out and, um, you yeah, know, they signed very shortly after. Wow. Um, so to me, the long-winded answer to your question is you, I don't, I still don't necessarily need to see all these followers and likes because it's not just a popularity contest. You know, it's like, it's, you've got to have the identity of the songs. And, you know, I think music's going to come back to performing live again too. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, if it's, I don't know, that's, that's just my, my intrinsic feeling. I, I feel much better signing something that I believe in 100%. Um, they don't need the fan base, all that kind of stuff. Uh, for me, it's, it's definitely great because it sells it. Record label, right. all they do is like, what's their socials? What's their metrics? Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty depressing. And then you go, well, did you listen to these songs? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know how, you know how much time and effort it's going to take to build that? That's the way record labels look at it these days. Um, there are some, there's like, you know, uh, like... Uh, AWOL and, and you know like Cobalt has development uh, there's, there's labels that are developing uh, projects but for me it's not just about you know your socials it's got to be I, I just got to feel in, inside my you know my heart that there's something there mm -hmm. yeah because it's really interesting to me with with wow. with that I mean well the Allison at Spotify I mean she's the head, head of rock programming there mm -hmm. she could break she could make a band I would think pretty if she put out a song People are going to react to it, but but like, but to your point, grandson stuck, and people are like, "I love this." She could put out any band, and it could get a bunch of streams right away. But that doesn't mean anyone's going to listen to the next single right. or the next song. 
So yeah. there is a little bit of that there. Cause I, I and that just kind of came to me right now. Cause I was always thinking like, well, if I was an A&R or label, I would just go exactly what you said, go to their Spotify. Oh, they only have 5,000 streams. Who cares about this? Right. And so back to the story with the drummer, Tyler was blowing up and he got a, a deal and, and he goes, I got to decide if I'm going to go to Nashville to be, to, you know, be with Tyler's band, mm-hmm. which, you know, they're already playing arenas. Wow. <laughs> and I'm like, bro, I'm, uh, he would just be playing me. So me and David were like super surf buddies. Uh-huh. We'd go, you know, from, you know, Hollywood all the way, you know, in the car and in our ports. And it would just, I just remember the surfboard thing flapping. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, and we just cranking the grants. I'm like, dude, these are hits. These are freaking hits. I'm like, how does this band not have a deal? And uh, I just was floored. I'm like, stick, stick with Branson, man. And he, he felt the same. So he stuck. And, you know, the, uh, you know, obviously, I think there's so much more upside with a unique band like that because, I mean, Jordan's just brilliant. Mm-hmm. And the music's brilliant. And it's engaging. And it's iconic. And that kid's got a voice and a presence. And to me, that's one of the few rock bands that I think really uh, make a difference. You know, the other, everything else sounds like something else, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's got such a unique sound. And he, like, when we, when we interviewed him, he was such a cool guy. He just went off for forever. He, yeah, he was, well, he was one of lyrics are amazing. Genius, yeah. He's a poet. <laughs> totally, totally. That's why I tell him, like, he's like a Bob Dylan, you know? Um, uh-huh. So, yeah, to me, I, I was astounded that they didn't get nominated for a Grammy, to be honest with you. Yeah, that is pretty shocking, actually. Yeah, um, um, especially with the success of that 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 record he put out. Yeah, and in the songs, all the new songs are great too. But it's just, uh, yeah. Anyways, uh, it's cool. uh, well, you said he's in your in the docu series that you yeah. put out. So tell me about so what what's the podcast? What's the docu series? Well, I've got three things. I got the book, which is yeah, you know, yeah. Well, tell me about the book first, then, because you put uh, the book just came out last month. Book came out last month. The response has been really, really incredible. Mm-hmm. And I feel very blessed that I did variations of the book. So it's very, very difficult. Like I was writing the same time I was also writing a screenplay and the screen oh was way easier to write. And I got a lot of interest on that right now, but the book has to be, you know, completely factual. So I was going through, you know, just faxes and, and, and emails. And I, a, a long time ago, Kiss was one of my favorite bands mm-hmm. and Gene Simmons told me, He's like, if you believe in something, keep everything, keep every napkin, keep every blah, 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 because it'll be worth something someday. I just remember going like, you know, I was Gene Simmons, like, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, I'll you say, but. And so I kept every single thing. And I, and I, the minute I started in the music business, um, I kept a journal just because I couldn't believe I had a job, you know? Mm-hmm. But, you know, law school, I was voted, you know, most likely to fail, you know? <laughs> Uh, and there was a, there was a, it was a secret ballot, but I clearly there was one thing I won. So <laughs> you did win though. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And uh, so I, I literally had every little thing. I had my original fax to my my boss saying like, "Hey, my intern, you know this, you know his band is amazing. You know, I went to go see his first show. Yeah, yeah. That's why I have every single documented everything. Um, that's awesome." But, uh, Wait, what was your, I, mean, I totally got lost in where I was going. What was your question? Oh, I just wanted to hear a little bit about the book. <laughs> oh, the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the book, long story short, is, and it turned out instead of being like a tell-all, it mm-hmm. is kind of a educational how-to music book and really focuses on being inspiration and how to succeed in anything. Like, we're going to be, every single person is rejected, you know, in, in, in our life. And we go through things where it's just constant, you know, no, 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 no. But it is a testament to the band and how our team overcame rejection. We had 44 showcases mm-hmm. as uh, between Zero, Hybrid Theory, and Lincoln Park. And this book is about not giving up, completely honing your craft, knowing when to cut things, knowing when to change things, knowing what to listen to and what not to listen to, following your gut, following your instinct. It's about songwriting. It's about a It goes into everything about music publishing, uh, demo deals, um, you know, record deals, marketing, promotion. 
So it basically covers the entire lifespan of when I discovered Brad as my intern and him making that comment about how he's going to have a band that was better than, you know, Corn and Limp Biscuit, uh-huh. all the way through, you know, doing a development deal in publishing and going through all these, you know, these showcases that we did, rejection after rejection. And, and instead of, uh, like most people would, you know, kind of give up, this band, you know, had the fortitude to pr- push forward. And the team that, you know, and that the philosophy that was built behind that and the belief not to give up. And then once we got to Warner Brothers, we were almost dropped. And to go through that torture and it goes through, you know, the, the politics and the drama and the, you know, the fight to survive and the fight to stick to what you believe in and, um, you know, and have faith in, you know, look what happened. That was the number one uh, biggest debut album uh, of the 21st century. That's insane. And I mean, they're still, those records are still so uh, timeless and so awesome. And they still get so much play on the radio and, and, you know, and serious. And it's, that's so amazing to see that in somebody like how you, you just knew like how that's so inspirational. I love that. Yeah, I was between Macy Gray and Lincoln park. I was both told by everybody and I'll, I'll never forget sitting in my car career suicide. It was called. Wow. You got a job, Jeff. Why are you pushing? Why are you, why are you insisting on signing this band? I'm like, I got it. You know, so I, I had uh, Lincoln Park attached to my contract at uh, when I went to Warner Brothers. That is crazy. That's so yeah. cool. Just to make sure they want to get lost. I believe in them that much. Uh-huh. Wow. And then, yeah, so did everybody else. I mean, after, after the fact, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's the whole story. The book goes into the story. And you know, we had a... Um, we had this insane show at the whiskey. Um, we had a, a, a deal basically for me at going to Geffen Records after I signed Macy Gray and uh, the band decided to play a show at the whiskey. And, and they pushed me and the attorney, Danny Hayes, to invite everybody from the music industry out, which we reluctantly did. That show was a complete flop. Uh, oh, wow. After, yeah, we had everybody, Rick Rubin, uh, Clive Davis, you name it, every, every big industry head. It was a, this right during Christmas, we didn't think anybody would come out. And it was just endless lines of limos and, you know, corporate accounts. And we're like, oh my God, everybody in the world's here. And that's <laughs> the show was a disaster. Everybody walked out mid, mid show and me and the attorney were just up front, just going like, yeah. And turned around <laughs> at the end, it was like empty crickets, you know? Uh. <laughs> and uh, so we had a revamp. We ended up having to get rid of the, the lead singer and then uh, find, and I was, fortunate enough to find Chester Bennington. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was a whole, that's, I go into that entire story in the book um, and that guy's fortitude. I mean, the guy, it was, we were both, I think kind of drunk during uh, our meeting uh, over the phone. I was in South (laughs) by Southwest and he just got back from his birthday and a trip to Mexico and he was partying. And uh, the, the guy, Chester's attorney was like, yeah, you should check this guy out, you know, from Phoenix. So I'm like, let's call this guy, you know, after two <laughs> uh, vodkas. And uh, we get him on the phone and I convince him to, you know, send me this demo tape of, you know, I sent him all the music uh, that was, you know, the demo tracks and he sent back his own version. And I was like, this kid's got it, you uh-huh. know? And, um, you know, I mean, he left his birthday party to go do that. That's I mean, crazy. That, you know, who, yeah. who it's just, everything aligns and that kind of goes into the fact like you got to stop and listen sometimes you know people always go hey you got to listen to this band everybody's like oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah sure <laughs> as an a and r guy you've got to listen sometimes you just got to listen and turn over that one stone that you would walk by mm-hmm. you know i was at the we were drinking at, at south by southwest at the four seasons and this attorney goes you should check this kid out you know he's, he's in this band gray days i'm like all right, you know, let's, let's call them up. And we, you yeah. know, we had, it was right between happy hour and going to see other bands. And I just went on this rampage. I'm like, you got to get out. You know, I didn't read what this guy looked like. I never heard his music. I just, I was hyped. I don't know what the hell happened, but uh, yeah, he sent me his music and I was just like, this is the real deal. Dude. This is what we're, we've been missing. And yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it, the book goes into him coming out to LA and, you know, again, I had no idea what he looked like and he, <laughs> he didn't look the part. And, you know, again, just like with Macy Gray, she didn't look the part at all. And I just remember looking at Chester going like, how did this voice come out, you know, come out of you? Right, right. Bottle glasses, he had like twisted right. hair. Spiky <laughs> hair out. 
the one thing I'll never forget, he came in wearing this, you know, he's he's kind of skinny. Yeah. And this big oversized shirt with sparkles everywhere. And I was like, oh my God, like, like, like some, some like, you know, kindergarten kids like bedazzled them. Like, <laughs> they were literal, I'm like, the band's gonna, you know, go nuts. I'm like, here, and I went and got him a, a shirt. Uh, I think it was a Tupac shirt next door to this guy. Cause we did um, all this sync stuff. And I'm like, here, throw this on, you know. <laughs> yeah, here's yeah, some so clothes, you your hair a little bit, you know. <laughs> and, you know, uh, it goes to his process about, you know, almost not, you know, being in the band to him, you know, changing what we, you know, the world of rock as we know today. Sure. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. That's so crazy. Yeah. I can't wait to read the book and, and I'm really interested in that part of it because his grade eight, like going from grade A's into Lincoln park, I've, I've kind of researched a little bit about that, especially um, right after when Chester Bennington passed uh, grade A's, I think they re-released or they had songs and they like re put his vocal on it or they did some, they released some record with his voice. Yeah. Yeah, so I, th- I was really fascinating. Oh, well, so with the, the docuseries you're doing, is that similar t- uh, to the book as far as like teaching people like a uh, linear path to the music industry? So the docuseries is different than the podcast, the two different podcasts I'm doing. So the oh, okay, so it's two, two uh, different podcasts. On the okay. history of a And it starts with basically the 70s. So you've got like people like Jerry Greenberg, um, who, you know, did Genesis, Foreigner, worked with mm-hmm. ACDC, Zeppelin, and, and Atlantic, and goes through the 80s, and, you know, uh, you know, Michael Rosenblatt and uh, Madonna, and the story of how, you know, he brought in Madonna to Seymour Stein, who was in, had heart surgery, and is in, in his hospital bed, and Madonna comes in and basically does a little showcase for him in his hospital bed. <laughs> That's and, awesome. And just knowing, you know, what, what makes stars, what a r people look for, and the socioeconomic situations of that time. So, you know, you've got the different genres and, and how everybody sees things and why people take a chance on certain things. And it goes into, you know, stories from rock to pop to dance. Uh, you know, I, we get into, you know, Foo Fighters, Bruce Flores in it with, you know, Foo Fighters and, and Dave Matthews. And, you know, I, I talk about Lincoln Park and how many people had passed on that in the story of Macy Gray, you know, anywhere from Jay Z to then when and Allison uh, from Spotify is in it with you know and I interview Jordan. And that's just the sizzle reel. Wow, but this is just a sizzle. And uh, so that's the the docu series, and then the podcast I'm doing is with uh, Ad from iHeartRadio, and we're going okay. To- yeah, he used to be on the afternoons in San Diego. Yeah, he yeah he he used to be in yeah now he's in Vegas yeah he used yeah. To be- he used to do afternoons. I, I worked on the radio here in San Diego forever. So I know a lot of these people. <laughs> yeah, so he's great. We have this, you know, I've known the kid since 96, 97. Oh, wow. Yeah, because so, he was originally from Texas or he did, some, or I don't know if he's originally no, from there. He's I know. From Is he? Yeah, this is a guy I remember I told you I was, uh, I went to go see a band in London. And yeah. he was the second band I ever signed. I signed my band first, then I signed his band and they were based in London. Oh, AD um, was the guy that you're talking about? Yes. Oh my God! It's, but he doesn't have a British act. I'm so confused. No, he was an American. His, I think, his father was stationed. Or had uh, okay, I was like, now it all, it all makes sense now. It all, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, and we we actually talk on, on our podcast. We talk. So basically, our podcast is about finding things and how we find things and how we, you know, in the entertainment industry, you've got to uncover those those rocks like we're talking about, you know, right, like, right. You got to stop and you can't just focus on, Hey, this person has so many plays. Blah, 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 blah. Let's go chase it. It's a, you know, it's getting ready to play the true art of discovering and why as human beings, we need to stop and be present. And we apply that to the music business. And, you know, we tell about all the crazy stories and the development stories. Um, and you know, it, it's a, it's more inspirational. And that's actually going back to the book. Mm-hmm. That's what the book is about. It's about, how we as human beings get inspired and passionate about certain things and we push forward and we, you know, we choose certain things to focus on and put our, you know, our passion into and how we can make or break those things and what the elements and the characteristics of successful people, um, if, we, if we have those and develop those, how we can make things happen or at least guide that vision in order to make it happen. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. 
Well, I have one more question for you. I love that. I love that. Um, and I can't wait to read the book. And, uh, and I'm super excited about this docuseries. Just the, the A&R world was something I wish I would have gotten into. Or I always ha like had dreams of like, that would be like the coolest job to just listen to music and go to shows and like try to find the next band. Uh, so like, like I, the next best thing for me was the radio because I got to meet all the people. And I thought I was, was like, that was for me. I, like, I love it. So I, I'm super intrigued. And I, and I can't wait to check it out. Most, the most... Uh, rewarding things for me was, you know, after I, I'd done Lincoln, I, I'd written with, you know, Hoobastank and all these different people, but I was leaving RCA. I mean, I got to produce stuff like Better Than Ezra. and uh, Yeah, I did see that. That's so rad. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, and I did, uh, I was lucky enough, like all these different experiences, I was able to do uh, Queen of the Damned, you know, the soundtrack, which was, mm -hmm. you know, a compilation of all these amazing rock artists. Um, and I started, you know, getting more into writing and producing. Um, there was one band that, you know, I always wondered how it would be to have a one hit wonder. Yeah. <laughs> and I was super influenced by um, all the 70s artists, you know, with these one hit wonders were so amazing. And now you go back and listen to it, everything sounds like that one song. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they and kept like, chasing that hit. <laughs> yeah, it was ridiculous. Um, I'm like, oh, well, you know, I've never had a one hit wonder. Well, I haven't, you know, I had a two hit wonder with this one, one project called The Last Good Night. And it was another random thing. Like this kid, I was at RCA. This kid shows up in my office. I gave him a card. And this kid shows up in my office with his band. And I walk into my office and my sister's like, there's some band in your office? It was just like what happened with Brad. I'm like, it's a band in my office? And like, what, what the hell you let a band in my, you know? <laughs> did you have an appointment? Like, well, I didn't have any appointment. So I go in, there's guys packed in there. And this one artist, um, I go, I go, I didn't tell you to come into my office. He goes, you said I had a really good voice. I'm like, you do have a good voice. Doesn't mean you, you know. You just show up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I go, well, you're here. And I ended up working with them. I left RCA, uh, co-managed, and I went in, produced, and wrote with these guys. We had a, a number one hit in nine countries. Um, but we did a development deal at, at Virgin, which led to me working with Jason Flom and, and uh, at Virgin Records. And uh, there was a song called Pictures of You, which we still... If you ever go to Walmart or if you're shopping, you know, and you're in an elevator, you may hear my song. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I'll have to go back and check it out. For a band like a band like Lincoln Park, you, you know, they've been rejected and rejected. You said they did all these these showcases, and you had labels come out, and the, and it kind of flopped on them. Like, what made you want to keep working with this band, and what what was it that really? I mean, if everyone else was not <laughs> taking them, what made you want to keep pushing them? Well, I think that comes down to something that's missing in the music business is knowing the chemistry between people and knowing the actual members. When you have, when you have record labels just going off the social media, they really don't get to know the intrinsic value of the members of a band. And doing a development deal with the guys in Lincoln Park allowed me to understand that band dynamic. And there was very interesting things. Brad Dellison, was one of the most intelligent and well-spoken people I knew. Same with Mike Shinoda. Um, they were extremely intelligent and artistic in a variety of ways. You know, Mike was an artist. Brad was, you know, he was going to go to law school. Uh, and I have a quick question about Brad. He always wore headphones when he was playing on stage. What was he listening to? Was he at, was it is that was that what he used as like his in ear monitors? <laughs> or? Well, it was, uh, and people used to think it looked ridiculous because he had sensitive ears. At least oh, that. Okay. But he wasn't listening to anything. At least that he was. He was telling me it was you know he had sensitive ears. Um, but the thing was, and I had an, I had a meeting where people asked me like, why are you you know when when I was getting rejected constantly, I was at Zomba Publishing. I go, I mean these guys. They don't do drugs. They're super hyper focused on the music. They're dry, you know. They they are they're not the best musicians, but there's something about these guys. You know, they're not the partier guys. They're gonna throw a TV out the window. They're gonna own you know the hotel that somebody else is throwing a TV out. Like they're they're very focused, and they kept writing. And as much rejection as we had, they kept focusing on make it better you know create more and i drove them like hardcore i was like yeah this isn't good enough this isn't working i think my background as a journalist where i was analyzing all the you know uh performance you know songwriting musicianship 
you know, style that helped me communicate when I liked something or didn't. Um, but, you know, obviously the band completely was, you know, writing their butts off and would constantly come up with, with, with uh, music. And finally, that development process, because we weren't under like, hey, you got to make a record right now. That development process allowed the band to achieve their vision and find that chemistry. And that was what's so, so important that these individual members were intelligent enough to know we're not just getting rejection, we're getting better. Yeah, that's what's really interesting to me. You would think after, you know, a couple times being rejected or having these showcases and then everyone's like, yeah, I don't really think this is it for me. You would assume that these, that, that it's like, well, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I wasn't meant to be a singer in a band. Maybe I wasn't meant to be a guitar player. Uh, I'm going to go do law or whatever. But it's interesting that they just kept sticking with it. Not, like, nothing stopped, stopped them. It was like, I felt like I was getting punched up. You know, every, every meeting I would go into was like, you know, like they, they'd, they had the stereos and they'd, they'd be blasting. They're like, oh, okay, cool. And before the song was over, they'd reach over to the knob and go, <laughs> to, like, hey, we should do lunch. They didn't even get to the, like, the second song. They're like, yeah, this is really good. Shoot, eject. Thank you very much. You know, let's go grab lunch. Were, were they always like um, kind of like when you're working at, the, at these companies, were, you, were they always kind of like your little like side project, so to speak? Like you're talking about like they're your band, but like you're obviously working at a, a record label. So you have to give attention to other people. And if you're in there t trying to push Linkin Park every time and they're like, we don't want them, we don't want them, we don't want them. At what point do they go, you know, you you keep these guys on and because I guess you know where my question's going where you you're developing this band and they're not appreciating or not, they don't want it want them but they're allowing you to keep working with well, them so this is interesting so i signed them to a publishing deal first oh okay. okay okay so which is really important to understand i signed these guys to a co-publishing deal where a pu publishing companies i'm sure you know own or co-own the copyrights right so right, right my job at that point when i signed brad and his band was to get them a record deal at another record company. Oh, okay. Because I had success with Limp Bizkit and Korn and Macy Gray in the publishing realm. I was able, record labels wanted to hire me. Got so it. it goes through the process of me choosing the record label. And I chose Warner Brothers um, because they actually liked a guy named Joe McEwen. Joe McEwen actually liked the band, whereas all these other record labels that offered me a &R jobs um, really didn't like the band. So I took half, basically half the, the employment, uh, you know, salary to go to Warner Brothers. Um, so at the time, nobody wanted them. I, I just stuck with it because I believed 100% in these guys and I could. They were signed to me, I, but they didn't have a record deal at the time. By the time we went to Warner Brothers, and this is the crazy thing, and this is something maybe all your listeners should understand, the turnover on executives is insane. So wow. I, I signed the band to Zomba Publishing. Mm -hmm. We were there almost three years. I finally get a job and I take this job at Warner Brothers, but Zomba wouldn't let me out of my contract oh. for nine months. So during that nine month period, we were still, I, I was having the band right and everything like that. You know, I had my agreement to go into Warner Brothers in March of 2000. Mm -hmm. And by that time though, in the lag of the nine months, the guy who signed me, as an a &R person and like the band was basically let go. Oh. So we come in to a situation and this is, this is the part of the book that's super intense. We uh, showcased for Warner Brothers three times for oh. a senior executive over there who's a legend in his you know, own right. He, uh, you know, he had produced Sublime, Bananarama, I mean, just you name it. Um, and he passed on the band three times. So by the time I get over to Warner Brothers and we start making the, like a couple days before we start making the record, I get a call and it's like, guess who your new boss is? The guy who passed in the band. The guy who time. passed in the band a bunch of times. That's just like straight out of a movie, you know? Oh like a gosh. bad movie. Where you going? Yeah. To, you know? And uh, so that time period of development really, I was like, yeah, we, we, don't, we don't have a chance to really develop. This has got to be amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got to push harder and the, we, we didn't have a, 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 my boss that was going to be lenient on this. 
So in a way, it was a good thing. And it was a very hard thing. But my new boss was like, yo, I don't, I, he didn't really like what was going on. He didn't like, you know, the rapper. He didn't like, the, he didn't think the songs were there. And so I was like, yo, the, the pressure just went up a thousand fold to make sure that every single second, I mean, I was laboring over every little detail, you know, cutting, I, I want to cut, you know, so-called cut the fat off, like a steak. Right. Like that. I don't yeah. want any fat. I right. wanted every single second of this record to have a point, mm-hmm. you know, and, and Don Gilmore was amazing with that. He was the producer, uh, very pop uh, efficient in this in structure. And so is the band. And they, and I think at the, the end of the outcome was that this album, you can't find one unnecessary note in there. You can't find <laughs> one second. Seriously, you cannot, we, we made it super short because I didn't want any like, oh, I didn't get that. They had that bridge kind of meanders. I wanted every single second of that record to have a function and to elicit an emotion. And I think that's what it did. Oh yeah, I would say so. <laughs> it was a punching thing like, um, and that's, you know, that's the only way I could survive there because my job was on the line. I, I just gotten there and it looked like I was gonna get let go for signing a band that, um, you know, the label now didn't want. But what happened was, by the time that album was finished, and this is an amazing story, you know, it was the expectations on it were so incredibly low that no, we were completely flying under the radar. Nobody expected anything. People weren't vibing it. And um, the head of radio, um, well, the, there was three guys. There was Rob Goldclain. Uh, oh, Gro- yeah, I know Rob Goldclain very well. Yeah, and uh, Rob was an early believer. And I would play Rob the demo. He's like, yeah, this is cool, this is cool. Um, and... Uh, and Mike Ritberg, and they played it. And this, uh, mind you, we were going to have the album come out, I believe, in uh, 2001, February. Mm-hmm. And we, I got a call, and Grover goes, "Hey, man, we played this at a music conference, and everybody's like, holy crap, this is amazing.' It was, and it was one step closer. One step closer. That was goes, the first one. I remember. We're moving this up. I'm like, you're moving it up. Then he goes, "Yeah, we're gonna. We're, this got to come out this year." And then just all of a sudden, it just shows you how you've got to be ready for anything because. Had we not gone in and you know mixed and mastered it really quick and, and believe in it, they would not have had the opportunity to play it at this music conference, which in turn, you know, was a domino effect. Like, so Warner Brothers came full, like 100% steam with this guy, Phil Q, who, who led the, you know, the entire team and pushed it. And, you know, it was like K-Rock, we had all these great, you know, stations backing it. And it just, you know, went from zero expectation to like this. And right. then, the whole Warner Brothers team got entirely behind the band and, and you know, the rest is history. The, the guys, you know, it went from a band that nobody ever heard of to being one of the, you know, the biggest bands in the world. Right. And that record being one of the biggest records of all time. I yeah, mean- and again, do you know what you just got to imagine for a band to have, you know, we don't, we want to, we don't want to see you play in your leaky little rehearsal spot anymore. Uh, less than a year later, to playing K-Rock Acoustic Christmas and playing all these monster uh, tours. I mean, yeah. from zero literally to number one. And that's what my book is called, Zero to Number One. I love that. That's so amazing. Did you want to add anything to the book for the book or? Um, yeah, sure, sure. Like, what, what do you think? Just ask me, what do you think? Uh, what do you think people uh, can get out of this? Well, who's, yeah. who's this book for? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, no worries. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> so, with the book, uh, the the book's called. Um, what, sorry, one, the book isn't called One Step Closer. Or it is called One Step Closer. It is a long name. It's called One Step Closer, uh, from zero to number one, becoming Lincoln Park. Oh, okay. So it is Lincoln Park's journey then. The whole the whole yeah. book is Lincoln Park's. Journey. Well, it's about my journey with Lincoln. Park. With Lincoln Park, got it. Okay. So, I mean, what, as a reader, what, like, what, what is somebody going to get out of this? Is this just for Lincoln Park fans? Is this somebody, is this for somebody that wants to become an A&R person? Is it for somebody that's in a band that wants to try to make it big? Like, what can somebody get from well, that's, that's the great thing is that this book is, initially was about my journey with Lincoln Park, but it's really a journey for anybody who wants to achieve anything in life. It doesn't have to be music. You definitely don't have to be a Lincoln Park fan. Uh, it is about anybody who has a dream and has the tenacity to see it through. Because, you know, 
all I hear from everybody, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm, I'm gonna start this thing, I'm gonna write this book, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna be an actor, I'm gonna be this. You know how many people actually follow through? Very, very Not few. many. <laughs> you know, um, you know, think about all the friends from high school go, I'm gonna be an athlete, I'm gonna be this, that. There's guys like Brad Delson, Mike Shinoda, Chester Bangin, you know, Rob, everybody in this band knew what the hell they were gonna do and would stop at nothing. So this is a, this book is for anybody who wants to know about leadership, like on my journey, how to deal with politics and drama and how to invest in what you believe in to artists who are rejected nonstop and are finding little hope and that extra inspiration, because all it takes is one person, you know, to believe in your project and it could be, and it could be rejected a thousand times, but all it is is one person who sees it and goes, you know what, I'm going to take a chance on you. And that is the catalyst to bring it forth. And this book is about that. It's about that journey because that journey happens every day in every, in every city, every town, everywhere, something is happening. And it's the people that persevere and focus and don't give up that succeed because it's way easier to give up than it is to try harder. And one of my favorite quotes, is by Wayne Gretzky. It's you miss a hundred percent of the shots that you don't take. Right. And that's that is a hundred percent the truth. And also, hesitation killed the warrior. That's my second one. You know, <laughs> like you hesitate, you don't go and you know talk to that one person who may be able to help you. They may know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. Right. Had Brad Delson not taken this internship with me and sat in my office chair and you know got there before I, I got to my office, maybe Lincoln wouldn't have happened. Maybe it would have, but. And for me to listen to this kid, I mean, there's just a million different things that have to happen. And if you read this book and internalize it and understand the journey, it can help anybody. I don't care if it's a sports team. I'm getting coaches uh, that are uh, hit me up from different teams going, this inspired my team, you know, the members of a football team. Mm -hmm. And that to me is the biggest reward. Like the, the journey of these young men who didn't give up and had a dream, but they persevered and they had the talent. And he just took the, the rejection and, and internalized it to make stronger product. So, yeah, I think it's for anybody in, in any form, if you're an executive or an artist or a talent. Yeah. And it's and how inspirational to a uh, story, too, because I didn't know that Lincoln Park and, and I've been a fan of music and been in radio forever. I didn't know that they were passed on so many times and and they've got because I hear this all the time from doing this podcast is I, I always ask that question. Um, you know, would you have any advice for aspiring artists? And 80% of the people I talk to say, don't give up. You're going to hear 100,000 people are going to tell you, no, 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 no. And then one person is going to tell you, you're going to get the one yes. And that one yes could change your life. And you yeah. are the one yes for Lincoln Park. And look, I mean. And I was the first person to hear it too. So it's the first yes and the last yes. But the interesting thing too is I was told the same thing in which I don't really discuss in my book. But in my journey, in my, in my quest to do ANR, I was rejected from literally from A to Z. And it was the final, uh, like when I, when I applied for my job at Zamba, I had no idea what the company was. <laughs> and it was the last, they, were, they used to call this, have this thing called the yellow pages of rock. And it was like, a, it, was a, it was like the yellow pages. You flip through it and every manager, publisher, blah, 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 blah. And I literally wow. exhausted every single A to Y, you know, X, Y, and boom. Z and I made, I'll never forget, I was on the phone and I called it, called New York and I'm like, Zamba, you know, I'm like Zamba, what the hell is Zamba, you know? And this guy answers and his name was Jeff Fenster. And Jeff became huge, you know, Britney Spears and a million different other artists who's at Jive. Mm -hmm. And he goes, hey, I think they're looking for somebody, uh, you know, in the publishing company. I go, oh, you know, I was just giving up. I'm like, I have a law degree. He goes, oh, so do I. And so does, you know, Richard Blackstone. I'm like, what? And he's like, he put me in this interview and I was rejected at first, but I came back. An interesting little side story again about rejection. When I went out to my meeting with Zamba, my David Renzer, who was uh, the boss, uh, he had me come in and within 10 minutes, he already decided he didn't want to hire me. Oh, he wow. Me. He, goes, he goes, what would you sign? You know, and I'm like, well, I would sign this band, you know, just gave him rattled off like five things. And I go, here, you want to hear some demos? He's like, no, I want to hear demos. He says, why don't you want to, Signed Pearl Jam or Nirvana, I go, because they're obvious. They're already the number one and two artists, you know, in the entire world. Right, right. He goes, well, why wouldn't you mention them? I'm like, well, you could just look at the billboard and choose. He goes, that's what we do here. 
And I go, well, I want a job where I'm going to be able to develop and discover. He goes, yeah, he goes, he goes, you're not right for this job. And I left there. He goes, you know, bye-bye. And I left and I was just like beyond pissed. I was yeah. like, there's no, there's no, you can't get farther than Z-O in the dictionary of any jobs. Z-O-M-B-A. That was it. I was done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I literally stayed, I was staying in their corporate apartments and I get this call when I get back to the, uh, the apartments and they're like, uh, yeah, we need you to vac vacate. And I'm like, I'm not leaving this, you know, it's, I'm in New York. <laughs> and, you know, so they sent a maid, you know, to clean up and they go, so I was eventually, I had to vacate and get my stuff out. And I stayed with a friend on her sofa uh, and the dog kept urinating on the sofa. So it was a bad experience. <laughs> and on Monday I showed up, you know, I just call up Zamba and I go, hey, I, I, want, I want five minutes with this guy, David Renzer. And they're like, uh, you know, okay, I guess you could come in. So he accepts, you know, you know, uh, me to go into his office. He goes, I got five minutes. What do you want? And I showed up in just a ripped t-shirt, ripped jeans. And, you know, my prior meeting, I was wearing like, you know, nice sweater, all this, you know, nice shoes, looking like an idiot. I just came in ripped, you know, <laughs> ripped everything. And I go, just want to let you know, you're making a huge mistake. I go, I'm going to make somebody a ton of money and it's not going to be you. And, and he goes, ah, he goes, you got a lot of chutzpah, kid. And I forget that and he's, you know, I'm like five, eight and a half, five, nine on a good day. And he was like six, two. And I'm looking up and he goes like, all right, thanks a lot. See you later. And I just walked out. I'm like, yeah, there he goes. I gave him my best shot and I was rejected again. But when I went, I went back, I took a job as a, I finally got a job as an entertainment lawyer. And mm -hmm. the guy who hired me goes, I know you've been trying to get an A&R job for like years. He goes, promise me you're not going to take an A&R job. And I go, I promise you. I go, because knowing I had, there was nobody was going to hire me. Right. You had already tried. <laughs> I go, I'm not going to take an a and job. Sure enough, three weeks into, uh, into uh, my job as a lawyer. And I was, I actually litigated a case for a famous, famous uh, composer named John Debney. Uh, and I, I did a lot. I just hit the ground running as a lawyer. I get a call from Neil Port now uh, who offered me the job. Wow. And as I said before, I guess that, you know, they couldn't find anybody to take a job for 25 grand a year. <laughs> I, I would have taken it for, you know, 10 grand. Right, I wanted right, to, be, of course. I need to get my foot in the door. And that's the other thing. Don't worry about the money. There's be, find your opportunities and take them. And whatever it is, if something falls in your path, you take it. Don't, you know, people haggle about money and you know, status. I took a job at Zomba who I never heard of for a very little amount of money less than I was making, I couldn't survive on, but I took it because I knew it would be a stepping stone. And I stayed there for five years and built all, you know, my track record before I went into a and to record label. Mm -hmm. So hope that answers your question. And Jeff, thank you so much, man, for doing this. I really appreciate it. Um, I do have one more question for you. We'll exactly. you here. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Well, of course. <laughs> and I first. think you're the guy that people want to hear the advice from. <laughs> Make sure you always go out with your best. You know, my, the one, the advice that I was given that really sticks with me is you can only be disappointed in yourself when you don't give it 100%. So you've got to absolutely find your own vision, find your own voice. Do not chase what everybody else says is, is hot. Because by the time you're doing that, you're just going to sound like everything else. You got to remember that everything else is on the radio right now or anything. Spotify is trending. That was developed two, three years ago. They've been working towards that. Stick with what your talent is. Stick with, you know, find, if you're a vocalist, go through and find out what your sweet spot is in your voice, right? And focus on that. If you have a, a quirk in your voice, just like, so I also worked with this guy, Daniel Powder, <clears throat> who had, you know, that song, Had a Bad Day. Oh, Yeah. I just loved his voice. He yeah, his voice. he does have a unique kind of sound to his voice. Not he didn't have that song when I originally started working with him, but I knew that he would come up with it. Macy Gray, <laughs> her voice. Chester had an iconic voice. John, Jonathan from Corn, iconic voice. Brad Durst is an iconic Durst, voice. yeah. Um, whatever it is, and those people, you can all trace back some type of vocal style that they have. So if you're a vocalist, find your style. Don't worry, don't try to be other people. Don't try to do what is, is trending right now. Do what you feel is your core talent and don't let other people tell you differently. Have somebody along with you that is gonna be along for the ride 
and help bring that talent out. Um, you've got to be very careful to choose your team. So um, that's incredibly important. You have to have somebody that knows what your best attributes are and how to amplify those. Um, and then, you know, don't give up if you really have the true talent. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people out there who don't unfortunately have the talent, but they have the money I'm being serious and they just, you know, they, they don't take it too seriously. And as an A&R person, you never want to be working or a manager. You never want to be working harder than your band. And I find that a lot. Um, I find a lot of people come to me and they've got talent, but I always end up doing more work than, you know, the artist. So you've got to find artists uh, if you're going to be an A&R person or a manager that are going to work and have that drive, but also have the talent. And, um, you know, don't give up, but have, you're going to get rejected by everybody in general, unless you're extremely lucky. You know, and it's that ability to listen to rejection and don't take it completely to heart, but listen to it. If there's a common denominator where people are going, hey, it's not this, that, or the other, listen to it, you know, when, but, and then make your adaptations accordingly, but don't give in to what everybody's saying. Like if I had done that, so Lincoln Park, everybody just goes, this has been done. Like, yeah, this is the big thing. Oh, we've heard it, you know, it's rap rock. It's rap rock's dead, no joke. I heard that from everybody. There wasn't one person who goes, hey, this is unique. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there going, it sounds hella unique to me. Like you got right. Mike Shinoda as a killer rapper and you've got the integration of this amazing melodic vocalist in Chester Bennington. Mm -hmm. So I didn't understand what people were saying. So I didn't change that, you know, that format. It, it didn't ban. That's what, you know. Um, so, but we did focus on the songs and the band really came through and I kept pushing the right strong and stronger transition so it blends seamlessly you know mike and chester were geniuses so was brad i mean the guys were amazing uh so you've got to have that drive and, and perseverance so um you know that's what i would say just if you're trying to get into business yeah don't give up but don't also the, the interesting thing is don't just go the way that you think you need to you know build fans 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 focus on your writing somebody will hear it you know i'm always not always but i'm, I'm available to listen you know um and there's people out there that will listen. And if, if it's meant to be, you will end up in the right hands. You just got to have faith. Bring me the best word.